Kia ora koutou everyone, welcome everyone to our inaugural and perhaps full of a few teething problems, we're all <laughs> doctor at CME and this is the way of things. Um, so this is brought to you by our University of Otago Rural Postgraduate Programme along with the Division of Rural Hospital Medicine. So my name is Matilda Hamilton and I'm a Rural Hospital Registrar and uh, the CME convener for the Rural Postgrad Programme. So it's really exciting to have you all here tonight. This is an initiative which we want to bring CME to rural doctors that takes into account our rural context that we work in and is overcoming both geographical and financial barriers to, to up-to-date CME. We hope to keep bringing these to you on a quarterly basis, um, covering both clinical and non-clinical topics. These webinars will be recorded and stored for future viewing and listening, and we are going to utilise a few forums for that, uh, but in particular Rory Miller's rural academic blog, uh, Leaning on Fence Post, that some of you may know. And I will email these links to you after the webinar, and you're welcome to share them with other, um, other people. So the session this evening is going to cover AF and SVT, and we'll, um, we'll go for about an hour. If you do have questions during the, um, the webinar, please enter them into the chat box, and uh, these are going to be picked up by um, Gary Nixon, now just recently Associate Professor of Rural Medicine, Yay. Um, which is something we can celebrate today as well. And so um, Gary will be feeding those questions throughout the um, webinar. And we hope to get through as many as possible and many of you have already provided some. So just a few housekeeping matters. You're, you will have already noticed that your microphones and your cameras are off and this is to assist with the quality of the, um, the webinar. And we may have an opportunity to unmute everybody at the end, but at the moment we'll just use the chat box for questions. Um, if for some reason you drop off the webinar, during the, um, during the time that we're here, simply just rejoin with the link that you had. And if you have significant trouble, as I mentioned earlier, you will be able to watch the recording um, later on. So let us get underway. So it is my great pleasure to um, introduce our guest speaker tonight. And this is Associate uh, Professor Jerry Wilkins. Jerry is a well-loved cardiologist from Dunedin who understands the rural environment well, having delivered clinics in central Otago for many years, including today, racing back to Dunedin, and has, ta has taught on our postgraduate pro um, program for quite some time. I've been lucky to be taught by Jerry since I was a med student. Many of the concepts he's taught me are integral to my practice today. So thank you, Jerry, for being with us. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. So we're going to begin with we're going to begin with um, discussing AF, Jerry. Yep. So, I mean, this is a topic that we're all familiar with and we encounter on an everyday basis, but still remains somewhat mysterious as every situation seems to be somewhat different. So I was just wondering, just for some background, if you could just remind us about the important sort of epidemiological um, features uh, of, of AF and some of the, you know, important pathological sequelae that we need to be aware of. Yeah, so atrial fibrillation is incredibly common. And, you know, everyone wants to claim an epidemic, but I think it's reasonable to think about atrial fibrillation as an epidemic. As we all live longer, the chances of having atrial fibrillation have risen uh, drastically. So the occurrence of atrial fibrillation in, say, a student town like Dunedin, there's a cluster of it around young people who perhaps binge drink, tut tut, at Otago University, the so-called holiday heart. So their toxic things, stressful things can produce atrial fibrillation in young people. But really the occurrence of it in very young people is extremely rare. So about somewhere in the 50s, you start to see a few cases. By the middle of the 60s, it might be a few percent. By the 70s, it gets up, people would claim as high as 15% of people have had or are in atrial fibrillation. And then by the 80s, it's up into the mid 30s percent. So this is a disease of getting older and it's incredibly common in an older age group if you look after them. Um, and if you investigate or look for it, you find a lot more than you expect. <coughs> what are the sequelae? Um, as early as the first round of the Framingham study, remember we're up to the third generation of the Framingham study the occurrence of atrial fibrillation non-specifically is a high risk feature which predicts a higher mortality, so an earlier death. Uh, 
and probably in part that's an indicator of other things that are going on but in part it signals the two really common illnesses that go with atrial fibrillation and they are and I, and I always boil it down into incredibly simple ideas it goes too fast and damages the heart because of that so you end up with cardiac symptoms and secondly completely unrelated to that is the idea that it's a commonest cause in the world of stroke by mm. far and so you, you're thinking of two different pathologies and we'll get to that in a minute i suppose it, it we should add here that these things have become easier to manage now. The biggest risk factors, if you had to try and figure out why people get atrial fibrillation, they're really the same risk factors as for say type two diabetes or atherosclerotic disease. That's age, indolent, you know, not moving enough, not keeping mm. active, uh, gaining weight, hypertension, uh, uh, I'm sure there are others, all of those kind of things, inflammation are all the same things. And I'll only mention this once, but some of you will be aware that there are quite good animal models, the so-called fat sheep that a guy called Prash Sanders in Adelaide looked at where it put them, made them fat. They got AF, made them skinny and get them active again and they lose AF. Mm. And in fact, even did the same thing in humans where he got a, a, he convinced a group of people to really become active and lose more weight than almost all other diet studies. So it was one of the best things in that regard. But his intervention with weight and activity was almost as effective as any other medical thing that he did to the alternative group. Mm. So the weight loss studies for AF are very persuasive as well. Mm. Yet another reason to be encouraging people in that direction. Yeah. Yeah. I just wondered if you could comment, Jerry. I mean, I, you mentioned that the, the risk of stroke associated with, um, with atrial fibrillation. Can you just remind us, you know, what kind of strokes we're dealing with when we're thinking about AF? Yeah. So obviously strokes come in three general categories, little embolic things that AF causes, uh, atherosclerotic things where you block an artery, and the really bad ones are those hemorrhagic ones where you bleed into your brain, where the coning and mortality of that is exceedingly high. So atrial fibrillation, don't get me wrong, they can be big strokes, but many of them are quite small events or even multiple events. They tend to be strokes that you can recover from, but they're nonetheless strokes and they multiple holes give multiple uh, causes for dementia as well yep. as just stroke. Yeah. Yeah. When we're working with patients with new F, new AF, you know, what, what do you think are the important things that we need to take both from history, but also from the patient's comorbidities and background when we're working them up? And along with that, what investigations do we need to pursue? In particular, I'll just note that already Lucinda, one of the um, uh, participants has asked around echo which is one of the most crucial things rurally that we don't have easy access to you know how, how do we select the patients that, that need echo well i think i'll answer that one straight up i think if it's new af you should start with the concept that calmly you'll organize an echo in everyone if they haven't had one okay. I, I don't think it's good enough in you know 2019 to to sort of somehow assume that there isn't a structural problem in the heart and being aware of that is really important. It, it's not about urgency, though, and we'll get to talking about management in a minute. Yep. But it's really a calmly organized that. Yep. So if it takes a while, so what? As long as you do that at some stage. Yep. So what do we need? We need, so I'm going to say this over and over again. There is a definite change in a way we wish to manage atrial fibrillation informed by proper research studies. We want to calm down mm. and we want to manage it in a much more gradual way. So the information that I always want to know is, um, do you think this has happened before if it's yeah. paroxysmal? And a lot of people, it's not a new event. They put up with it on a few previous. Uh, are they really aware of it or is mm. it just found because I think we all ruin people's expectations 
straight up front by somehow turning it into an emergency when we don't have to do that anymore. We probably never had to do it in the first place, but the behavior of one old fashioned drug caused us all to behave in a very odd way. Drugs called warfarin, and we'll talk about that. So a lot of people are in atrial fibrillation and it doesn't really, uh, they don't register it. It's just that everyone medically around them has got their knickers in a knot. And that's quite important for what you need to offer them later. Um, I think you should always look for renal dysfunction, thyroid toxicosis. Uh, so, you know, I would do routine things for signs of inflammation, signs of uh, renal dysfunction, including electrolytes, thyroid toxicosis, and just general screens of general health. If the symptoms in that person led you to do that because AF is often a secondary phenomenon to something else that's going on. Uh, the majority of AF is called non-valvular and not related to structural heart disease. It just is electrical and it, it is AF. And the other big hang up that we all have is somehow when people turn it up and with atrial fibrillation, we somehow, try to think that that's related to coronary disease. Well, mm. it's got nothing to do with coronary disease and 99.9% .9 of people. We occasionally during infarction with big infarcts see people slip into AF, probably yep. because they've got heart failure physiology going on at the same time. But yep. one is not causative of the other. Yep. After all, there are hardly any coronary artery branches going to the atria. They, do, they, they mm. thin things and, and don't need blood supply. Mm -hmm. So it's about thinking about the previous history, people's expectations, where they are in life. You know, a 40-year-old uh, triathlete may have different expectations than a not very active 80-year-old person. And you need to understand that and what you then deliver. And um, screening them for all possible other uh, illnesses and a gentle but definite way temperature yep. all that yep. kind of stuff fire yep. toxicosis and that stuff yeah uh, naturally jerry your comments um and this topic of investigation has brought up the issue and i can see it coming up in our chat of troponin and i guess that i, I will ask gary to sort of synthesize those questions but i can my my, my first question would be do we need to be checking troponin in patients who are presenting with fast 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 AF and then if we are in the situation that that has been checked and we're faced with a, a positive troponin whether or not we ask for it or not how we deal with that once we've got it so I don't think you should check a troponin because then you won't know what to do with it <laughs> now if the person comes in with chest pain that's different but if it's a presentation of atrial fibrillation a troponin is not going to inform you of anything and it'll sometimes come back elevated a so-called type 2 event mm. Uh, I guess I should assume nothing, although many of you now will go, I hope he's not going to tell me about that. But what is a type 2 event? Uh, because troponins have got so incredibly sensitive, we now find things that we didn't know existed previously. So a new universal definition of myocardial infarction had to come out a year or so ago when high sensitivity troponin came along. Type 1 events are the things that are associated with a chest pain syndrome, often with ST changes, ST elevation or depression, and that's a plaque rupture. There you've got embolic material or a blocked coronary artery causing cell damage and a troponin rise. A type two event is when you haven't got that. It's not an acute mm. coronary syndrome and you do something to the heart like stretching the hell out of it. For instance, a pulmonary embolism makes the right ventricle go, oh, I don't like that. And mm. you'll leak troponin from the right ventricle. Atrial fibrillation in older people will often do the same thing. You didn't need to know that yep. because it now confounds what you're thinking. Yep. And in many ways, don't tick boxes with troponin unless you have chest pain or ECG changes that look like a myocardial infarction. And then it won't, it's just baggage that you don't need. Yeah. Okay. Um, Gary, I might just ask you at this point if there's any questions that you'd like to add from the chat that fit with what Jerry's already spoken about. The most common questions were those ones around um, around the the use of troponins. 
and I think Jerry answered that um, particularly well. And just when he tell us, told us that there's not a great uh, connection at all between um, ischemic heart disease and, um, and, and atrial fibrillation. But, but Jerry, I've just, I've just got one other question for you, just a little bit uh, uh, around that. And, and that is that although there's probably very little relationship between um, uh, plaque rupture in a coronary artery and atrial mm. fibrillation, which is what which is generally we, why we look for elevated troponins and 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 that, that particular management plan that we understand so clearly around moving on to PCI, but but can sometimes we think of, of rapid atrial fibrillation as a bit of a stress test? And that, and that sort of patient who has quite marked ST depression laterally um, and perhaps chest pain when they get their, their rapid atrial fibrillation. And can we assume that perhaps those patients have stable coronary artery disease? And although we shouldn't be rushing them off for a PCI, we should be thinking about managing them for that. Yeah, and I think that's right. So if you're, you know, sedentary and 78 and your heart rate hasn't gone above 110 for years and suddenly you're doing 150, it is like running on a treadmill and you do see STL de depression like on a treadmill test. So I think Gary's right. You need to be mindful of that. But what, and Gary's leading me to say this to you, um, it isn't the same as plaque rupture in terms of the natural history. All of the trials of aggressive intervention around acute coronary syndromes assume that a plaque ruptured and therefore you do early coronary angiograms and you put them on, you know, cholesterol lowering drugs and you put them on dual antiplatelet drugs and all the rest of it. You don't do that after a positive stress test with someone in stable angina. You might lower their cholesterol and put them on a beta blocker, but you don't run them into the cath lab immediately. You have a, have a think about the meaning of that and, in the context. So in certain circumstances in AF where chest pain is a feature, you should do a troponin. But if you think AF, you don't immediately think troponin unless there's the whole complex thing that people throw up for you on some occasions. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Gary. Um, so I guess this, Jerry, we're sort of shifting into the realm of, of management. Um, and I want you know, spend a few moments discussing rate versus rhythm. And, you know, I, I understand there has been a bit of a, a shift in practice. Um, you know, for whom should we be still considering trying to achieve rhythm control? And what, what options do we have for achieving that? And I guess importantly, and I've, you know, been a little confused about this recently with, with um, some more studies coming out about it, the safe time frame to be thinking about cardio beating somebody, um, yeah. you know, if they're not anticoagulated. Yeah. So this is, this is one of those things where heart and brain for doctors are difficult to disconnect sometimes. So the truth is that most people who end up in atrial fibrillation, even once and briefly, because of that age related structure I described to you, will end up in atrial fibrillation permanently eventually. In which case, uh, our threshold to accept atrial fibrillation should be pretty low. So I suppose what I'm saying, if I turn that around the other way, in the majority of people who are older, who are in atrial fibrillation, our start point in their management should be to accept that they're in atrial fibrillation and not scurry around trying to get them out of it. So in other words, manage the atrial fibrillation rate and remove the stroke risk mm. and do that immediately and then calmly think about what to do next. Yep. So we, we think it's a little artificial, but it's a useful way of thinking. We think about paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, those that come and go, and I'll come back to this, but they're the most difficult people because they don't want to do it again, but they're spontaneously coming and going. Then there's the idea of the halfway house where you can get them out of sinus rhythm if you shock them or you give them drugs that might cardiovert them. So that's called persistent. And then there's the people who really attempts to try any longer uh, futile, that's permanent AF. Mm. 
So I think if you think about that in these categories, let me start with the permanent, that's easy. There are really good trials of randomizing people to either rate control in an anticoagulant, and they are done long enough ago now, about 2009 if I remember, um, that warfarin was the drug. So warfarin and a drug to slow was one limb, so rate control and anticoagulation, versus everything to try and get people into sinus rhythm. There are two studies published in the same New England Journal, a European one that was a bit underpowered and a pretty big American one. And if you add the two together, basically there's a mortality endpoint. And the mortality endpoint is the harder you try, the higher the mortality. Yep. And that the most conservative management is to keep their rate control and keep them on anticoagulation which is a stunner if you think about it. Our heart tells us that we want to get this person into sinus rhythm, that they'll thank us. But the most dangerous thing you can do is try to hard, push people through needless ablations, lots of complicated drugs. You should talk them down or, or better still, don't lead them down the garden mm. path with one of those false promises that I can fix this. No, you can't. Atrial fibrillation in the majority of people beats us and we should opt for rate control and safety with a drug to mm. prevent stroke. Mm. Yeah. And it's a hard pill to swallow in many ways. Yep. Yeah. And if, but if we are looking at, you know, the younger patient who doesn't have comorbidities, yep. who they're particularly symptomatic and it yep. is appropriate to be aiming for, 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 them being in sinus yep. and we're going to do that for, with a with a medication what you know what medication options do we have yeah so matilda's right i should have said that those trials in the new england journal were were uh, the age group was around 65 or older so in younger people who are in and out of atrial fibrillation um basically they are already going into sinus rhythm and you're trying to stop them slipping out Mm. I think reason, the best drug by far is a beta blocker to start with because it's always safe and the highly cardiac selective beta blockers have very few um, side effects that are of importance. So I think you start with a beta blocker, you test that out at a reasonable dose. So with bisoprolol or metoprolol, that would be, you know, a small dose of bisoprolol is 2.5. Probably you need to go at least to five with bisoprolol, with metoprolol, it probably is 47. And if they keep having breakthrough, maybe 95. So those kind of doses. Um, there is no advantage with sotalol. You might, we might end up trying different beta blockers when we've run out of ideas, but there is no upfront advantage with, with, uh, with sotalol. The drugs are for people who genuinely can't take beta blockers. Um, Probably diltiazem would be the next thing you'd consider as a first line drug. Now, beyond that, you're running out of ideas because really there's only two things you can do. In the mm. elderly where they're not outside much, uh, where they've got other comorbidities, amiodarone is a really good drug to keep people in sinus rhythm. But I suppose what I'm saying to you in that age group, rate control is a better idea. Yeah. So amiodarone in a young person as a long-term solution is a disaster. They get bad photosensitivity. By the time you've had them on it for a few years, they run a, about a one in three risk of thyrotoxicosis. Yeah. And some of them have irreversible pulmonary fibrosis, but at the doses we use, that's very rare now. So the drug of choice then becomes, in younger people, probably a drug like flecainide which is a class one agent. And as you all know, these agents have a side effect of VT and sudden death. Mm. Oh, I know. <laughs> so here you are. So if, if you've done your due diligence, you've got an echo on them and they have a structurally normal heart. Mm. And if in doubt, you run them on a treadmill and they're not ischemic. If you're happy that they're in that category, and usually younger people with AFR, um, uh, Flecainide is a very good drug and allows good levels of exercise and so on as well. The combination of a very small amount of a beta blocker and some flecainide is a very good one as well. 
it's got some advantages actually technically compared to just flecainite alone. Yep. Yep. So just coming back to that timing thing, I'll give you a clinical picture that I think we'd all encounter in our, mm -hmm. you know, for those of us who work in hospitals. So young person has had atrial fibrillation before, so they, they know the feeling, but it's infrequent. They present in AF and they say, I've, I've converted before with, with flecainide. What is the appropriate or safe time window that we can consider giving them flecainide within that setting if they don't have their own? after their known onset? Are we talking 12 hours, 24 hours, or right out to that 48 hour window if they're not on um, anticoagulation yeah. medication? So Matilda's raising a really important sort of idea. Giving people a, a chemotherapeutic cardioversion drugs and putting them to sleep and giving them a shock is really the same idea. The risk is that you will embolize off a, um, a stroke as they convert from AF to atrial fibrillation. And therefore you then say, all right, is it when I know the time of the onset of atrial fibrillation, what's the window? Well, we've always worked with a 48 hour window and been happy about that. But some guys and gals in uh, Finland published this paper that throws that into question in the modern era. In effect, under 12 hours had a low stroke risk comparable to waiting and anticoagulating and cardioverting. But from 24 hours on, it was higher than an elective cardioversion risk. Mm. So I think we're really talking about a very narrow window now of 12 to 24 hours. If you're really trying to avoid um, a, a, about one and a one and a half percent increase in stroke risk, even in young people. Yep. Yeah, okay. so I think we should be reasonably strict about that because yep. a lot of that behavior was driven by uh, the window that warfarin left us, a weird drug, right? Yep. And we don't have that anymore. So we don't have to behave like that. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And then in the situation that you're going to send someone out in the community, you know, who's outside of that window and have them on some rate control drugs, have them anticoagulated, when can we or a cardiology service bring that patient back for an elective cardioversion if they haven't gone back into sinus? Like how long do they need to be anticoagulated for? So three weeks is the agreed period because yep. the new oral anticoagulants work immediately. Yep. So you have three genuine weeks of oral anticoagulation. That's where the risk of cardioversion drops down to between 0.3 and 0.8% stroke risk. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I think that's pretty acceptable. Yeah. Gary, have any other questions cropped up that sort of fit with the idea of um, rhythm control and, and those who are trying to get back in sinus as opposed to rate control? Uh, Mitchell, there's a couple of particular questions that Jerry sort of touched on briefly around anticoagulation and two particular subgroups. Mm -hmm. One, we're um, all pretty clear about the importance of using a scoring system like Chad's VASC um, scoring to help us make that decision. But what about patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, Jerry, and, and those with atrial fib, fib, an episode of atrial fibrillation that occurs during an intercurrent illness? Should we be treating them differently when it comes to uh, anticoagulation? So it turns out that paroxysmal atrial fibrillation is just as dangerous for stroke mm. as permanent AF. <coughs> Some estimates, you can't do this as a trial, of course, some estimates suggest that it's more dangerous because mm. as you convert to sinus rhythm, that's like teeing a golf ball up and knocking it out. You know, it's the sinus rhythm that shakes the clot out of your left atrial appendage. So worldwide august, you know, bodies who write guidelines treat all forms of AF, paroxysmal, persistent and permanent in exactly the same category and if you have AF, and he, here's the problem, what's the bottom, what's the least you can get away with? The answer is mostly the, the, the bodies are saying, they don't really state it, but the implication is that even one event is enough to anticoagulate people until you're sure that AF is not reoccurring. And even that's vague. Something like a year without it in a low risk person would be okay to stop, I think. So in other words, intercurrent illness, probably 
probably you should if they've got a high chance of our score, anticoagulate them because that's proof that they have AF under some circumstances mm. and it's highly likely that they'll do it again with a similar challenge and it may cause a stroke. Mm. Yeah. So it probably varies very much patient to patient if you, you know, have patients, for instance, with sepsis you need to look at their chads of ask and determine their, their overall risk like you would for any patient. Yes, yep. yes of course. I'll just slot in another question there around that issue of um, but the patient who who has an AF, say in the context of sepsis. And that is, if that is a, a patient who's, you know, their blood pressure's okay, you're satisfied with that, and they're in atrial fibrillation, do we, as the doctor treating them acutely, need to push to try and bring their AF rate down or likewise try and get them back to sinus rhythm while they're still unwell? Or is it really about just treating the underlying illness and waiting for time to do its thing? So you get the rate down and, and if they convert, well and good, but you don't need to set out to cardiovert them. Get mm. their rate down so that they don't end up with the uh, hemodynamic consequences of an uncontrolled heart rate. Mm. And obviously over some, if it's very fast, and it's over some weeks, you can end up with the, you know, cardiac consequences of that, a rate-related cardiomyopathy. Yep. Yep. So that kind of leads us into our, our next um, thing that I was going to discuss with you, Jerry, which is that rate control. You know, the patients who, who are in the community, they've got atrial fibrillation, they've accepted that, and we now need to control their rate. So just wondering if you could talk us through the, the options for drugs and not just our, our first line drugs, but what to add in second line, third line. Yep. When and where is there a role for digoxin, that kind of thing. Yep. So I suppose I should say, what do the studies tell us? How's, what's slow enough? Mm. So the thing that fools us all is that resting heart rates in AF can sometimes be relatively slow. Mm. You sometimes have to get someone to do a quick lap around a corridor or something. And I formally... When I, I, I try to see people with AF just once and, and try and give a decent package back to the referring doc. So I put almost everyone who has AF on a treadmill, not to diagnose their coronary disease, but to see what their rate does when they exercise. And you'll be surprised how often people who seem to have a really good rate at rest yeah. within about three minutes on a treadmill doing nothing, like walking down the corridor are up doing 120 and they're elderly. You know, that's their maximum heart rate. No wonder they feel awful. Yeah. So don't be fooled by resting pulse rates. Nonetheless, there are studies based around resting pulse rates. And for older patients, you should aim for a heart rate that's around 80. It doesn't have to be strictly controlled like 60 or 70. So mm. it's unlikely that people will slip into heart failure physiology if you just get their heart resting heart rates to about 80 or so. Yep. You know, under 100, in other words, really, on average. So what do, what do you use? The way the AV node works, so remember the AV node's the thing that allows the atria to talk to the ventricles. Yep. It's got slow fibers and it's got fast fibers. It's a bloody good thing it's got slow fibers because otherwise atrial fibrillation would drive the ventricle at whatever rate AF is, like 600 a minute, and atrial fibrillation would become ventricular fibrillation and no one would survive it. Yep. So the AV node automatically slows down the conduction rate, but a healthy AV node will often conduct with rates mm. that are around 150 or more. So what you're trying to do is slow down the slow fibers even more. There is marked sympathetic innovation of the slow fibers. So sympathetic activity, adrenaline and sympathetic nerves, as soon as you get up and exercise, enhance conduction because mm -hmm. that's how we, partly how we speed our heart rate up. So the key drug is a beta blocker. Yep. And I know that lots of you listening will have beta blocker prejudices, but cardiologists, cardiologists love them because they're incredibly safe and they always deliver. And I think we often talk patients out of them ourselves. Very large trials on side effects like sedation 
have shown them to be no different than placebo in the target group, which even me, I was you know, surprised to see that. But the highly cardiac selective ones are actually damn good. So we're talking about the soprolol that's the most cardioselective compared to propranolol, its effect on the heart. So propranolol's peripheral versus its cardiac effect is considered one to one. And uh, metoprolol is one to 38 and bisoprolol is one to 110. So in other words, any given tablet of bisoprolol is 110 times more likely to slow your heart down than cause, say, Raynaud's or sedation. So they are wildly cardiac selective, and effectively they are very unlikely to cause wheeze and true asthmatics. Mm. Now, there are hardly any true asthmatics in the 65 and older age group, so, you know, get over that. COPD doesn't have reactive airways. So there are very few, if any, contraindications to a beta blocker, at least at some dose. Yep. So if you can't use beta blockers at higher dose, don't throw them out, keep it on board and add something else. That's yep. where I'd probably in an older age group come up with digoxin, which is good at slowing resting heart rate, yep. but, it, but is useless when people get up and exercise because it doesn't slow down that sympathetic drive. But a combination of some digoxin, say two little pediatric tablets, and a small to moderate dose of a beta block is often a really good thing, yep. that combination. Um, if you really can't take a beta blocker, then digoxin um, plus, well, go with diltiazem or verapamil. Um, and you can use digoxin along with diltiazem or verapamil. There are people where you knowingly add all three together. Now, I wouldn't tend to add verapamil because it's quite, it's quite a bit more AV node slowing than diltiazem, but a combination of a bit of a beta blocker at the level that people can tolerate for the exercise thing, say 2.5 of bisoprolol or 23 or 47 of metoprolol and a lowish dose of long, slow release diltiazem um, is quite a good combination. Yeah. Now, I would usually end up adding that in as a third line drug. So you've already tried digoxin, but in a way, it's a little bit like managing hypertension. You sometimes have to, you know, add a bit of this and a bit of that yeah. to get the effects that you want without any sort of perceived side effects. Yeah. Do you think that, that as, you know, generalist doctors, GPs and hospital, we probably tend to stick to metoprolol and not branch out into the other beta blockers so much? Then we should uh, use different agents? I think, I think no metoprolol and bisoprolol well, because they are the mainstay of management. Yeah. I don't think you need to know other ones very much, really. Yep. yep. That's good. Know the dose steps well on some on common drugs and I think that's the best way to be really comfortable and confident about yep. what the doses mean. Yep. Yeah. And I mean you mentioned this earlier, the the, the rate related cardiomyopathies, and um, I've certainly seen my share of them in Dunstan Hospital. Um, and I was wondering if you could just talk about, you know, a little bit about, you know, what is a rate related cardiomyopathy, how do we treat it and what are the pitfalls? Like what why do you end up seeing these patients in clinic when things are not not going well? So um, a rate related cardiomyopathy is exactly what it sounds. A very common cause for slipping into heart failure is that the atrial fibrillation has been subclinical as far as the patient's concerned. So it's been there, they may not have even known or they know and they don't perceive it to be a problem. Their rate is probably inappropriately fast 24 hours of the day and that in some people, you know, there's no valve disease, there's no coronary disease. So in other words, they start out with a pristine heart. But if you leave someone's heart running flat out for too long, and it's probably variable between people, the heart muscle goes from a normal ejection fraction to an absolutely appalling dilated cardiomyopathy. And we have all shared patients where their ejection fraction well, it's in the teens and there's occasional single digit number like 9%, which you go, surely you can't get 9%, but you look at the heart and you go, oh, oh yep, yeah, that's for real. And that 
when you go back through the story and you only know this because the lucky thing is most of these ones recover better than some of the other cardiomyopathies. All you got to do is give them the evidence-based therapy and slow the heart rate right down and believe it. Just stick with it for a number of months and they get full recovery, which is very rewarding. Mm. And do you think that people can be a bit timid as far as giving the beta blockers and slowing their heart down? Yeah, well, I, I know they are. So yeah. you're aiming for a heart rate that's really on the slow side. So in other words, how would you know they have a heart cardiomyopathy? We are now talking about an era where imaging is intrinsic in all of this decision making. Mm. You, would, you would worry about it when someone turns up who is new onset heart failure, who is in fairly rapid atrial fibrillation, and they didn't know about it in whom a BNP is often very high. So a lot of people in AF are, have BNPs around 200 anyway, but a lot of these people have them, excuse me, um, in the many hundreds or thousands. Mm. And, you know, they've got all the other signs of severe heart failure, lots of edema, chest X-rays that look bad. And if you were able to do bedside echo in a rural hospital, you would look at the heart and it looks bloody awful. It's a big global dilated cardiomyopathy. For others who are managing that without bedside imaging, you may, by the time you get an echo from your, you know, wherever you get them, the, your central cardiology department, you may have already fixed a lot of them. Mm. So they turn up in heart failure and their echo doesn't show profound cardiomyopathy, but they may well have yep. several weeks before when you first saw them. Yep. Uh, but it doesn't mean that you should allow the AF to run fast. Yep. Gary, is there any questions that have cropped up related to that aspect of things? So there's, there's definitely a few questions around um, appropriate levels of, of rate control which sort of is, is sort of related to that. Um, the, and, and, and one is uh, when we are going back to those patients who have got an intercurrent illness and whether or not intuitively we tend to think that probably if they went in atrial fibrillation, they would have a bit of a tachycardia anyway. Um, and perhaps, you know, in that group, we shouldn't be uh, aiming for such tight, tight rate control. Um, and there was another question there. Once you cover that one, Jerry, just just around uh, how you t you suggest loading to Joxon uh, uh, acutely. Um, and and one very last one. I keep adding them in. One uh, very last one, which is what you have just brief already um, touched on, and is those patients who have um, rate related cardiomyopathy. Do they need all the other evidence based therapy for their cardiomyopathy as well as their uh, their rate control? So remember that you see these people and you hope they're going to recover. So no one has ever done a trial where they only gave the beta blocker and denied them the other treatments that have been shown to give survival and recovery. So the answer is yes. So that's easy. In a rate related cardiomyopathy, you'd also give them the ACE inhibitor and the spironolactone. But in truth, it's probably mostly about slowing them down. Uh, so I'll, I'll work my way backwards. Um, so, so the Jerry, can I just clarify the, that? Yeah. So if if even once the echo is improved and their ejection fraction is looking rosy, you still have to think this patient had a dreadful heart. We still need to carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because we no one has ever separated out rate related cardiomyopathies after the fact, because in a way you're never quite sure. And in the same way, there's no trial of removing evidence based therapy when someone has joyfully survived. You know. Uh, terrible heart and it's recovered. There's no evidence that you can withdraw it. In people who have wanted to, I have been in cardiology long enough that there's probably a 50% return to heart failure in that group. So I, yeah. and, tr and yeah, I might drop doses a little bit, but I impede, you know, I try to get people to stay on their medication. Yeah. To avoid further heart failure. So in the, in the intercurrent illness group, I agree that you can allow them to run a bit of a tachycardia, but you got to remember that what the maximum heart rate for age is in normal people. Remember, you know, when you're whatever most of you are in the twenties and thirties, 
your heart rate gets to 190 or something if you really push yourself. But 150 is way too fast for 80 year olds. The maximum heart rate's about 115 or something. So they shouldn't be running up around 130 and 150 in AF. That's not normal. So you need to treat that down to normal ranges. And the same thing as intercurrent illness, and you will all see this as well, is that lots and lots of people who have straightforward elective operations, gut, orthopedic, go into atrial fibrillation with their anesthetic and in their recovery phase. Well, you can't ignore that either. You need to, once they wound is, you know, and for so as far as the orthopedic surgeons, for instance, are concerned, their wounds find the next day, start them on their oral anticoagulant, slow their rate down, wait, because a lot of them will revert themselves and then do the same thing that we're talking about with every other AF case. It's the circumstances might be different, but it's the same old problem with the same old consequences, heart failure if you don't manage rate, and stroke if you don't manage with oral anticoagulation in high chads of our school patients. I'm missing one, am I, Gary? What did I not talk about? Digoxin loading, Jerry. What's your sort of acute digoxin loading regime? Yeah, so I, I tend not to use digoxin very often acutely, but I think you can easily give 0.5 or 0.75 as an oral dose, you know, 3.25 tablets. I almost always use digoxin at about half that, you know, half a, an, an adult tablet in most people in the older age group. The trouble with digoxin is that its toxicity range and its therapeutic range kind of overlap. <laughs> but you almost never get into trouble if you're using a couple of pediatric dose tablets because the way I think of it is that digoxin's not first-line indication for anything. It's an yeah. adjunctive tablet, a couple of little pediatric doses that you add in to try and reduce, say, a beta blocker or add a bit of more body to a diltiazem. It's yeah. never going to be the main course. Yeah. Yeah. So Jerry, that kind of leads into our, our final aspect of our atrial fibrillation measurement, that is the anticoagulation. You've already yep. mentioned Chad's VASC, and I was just wanting to make sure that Chad's VASC is still our decision-making tool of choice, and just wondered if there's, you want to comment on any limitations with the Chad's VASC, any things we need to be wary of when using it. So, um, no, I, I think this whole area has got so much easier with a simple calculator like Chad's VASC. Yep. It's, of course, it doesn't come from a randomized trial. It comes yep. from a huge observational database that's being added to all the time. And it's now up to like half a million or something observations. So it's robust. Um, it's, it's irrelevant if you're going to cardiovert someone. So if you're going to give someone a shock, even with a low CHADS VAS score, you still anticoagulate them that for the three weeks yep. before you shock them yep. because no one wants to wake the person up from their propothol with them gaga, right? It just isn't going to happen on my watch. Um, so it, you routinely anticoagulate whether the CHADS VAS score is high or low. It, it's, helps us think about the low risk people more than anyone else, to be honest. Yep. So if your CHADS VAS score is zero or one, we would agree that no one needs to be on anticoagulant long term. Or for, aspirin. So aspirin. So all the current guidelines, very good, Matilda, thanks for reminding me. All the current guidelines, and in particular the new European guidelines, say that nothing and aspirin are the same. Mm. So if you're not going to anticoagulate them, choose aspirin or nothing, meaning, and rightly so, that aspirin and nothing are about the same usefulness. Yep. Because the Except data, you get all the downsides of aspirin. <laughs> yeah. So the, it, correct. So I use nothing. Yep. So in other words, aspirin's never been shown convincingly to reduce stroke risk with atrial fibrillation in any trial. So yep. we shouldn't use it. We should just not allow patients to have that conversation with us in a way. We say, look, aspirin's no point. You just have a GI yep. bleed. Yep. It doesn't do anything. And look, we've got a drug that's just like taking an aspirin. You don't have to have blood tests. Yep. Take the stuff. Yep. Stop wimping out. Yeah. 
So now we live in a, a world that we, we have options beyond warfarin. I was just wondering if you could sort of comment on the, the different um, NOACs that we have available, if you have any preferences and if there's advantages or disadvantages of the ones that are available in New Zealand. Yeah, so that around the world, there are four of them. Um, in New Zealand, you can get a Pixaban, but the patient has to pay for it. So there are Edoxaban and Apixaban are not widely used in New Zealand mm. because Pharmac didn't, hasn't um, paid for those. Yeah. What we do have, all of them are excellent drugs and we don't need them all really for the majority of people. So the granddaddy of them is Pradaxa or Dibigatran, which is a, a factor two blocking agent. And that probably if you were to look at the head to head trials, um, is not equivalent to warfarin, it's superior to warfarin. And that's why Pharmac got that drug first. They followed the evidence where that drug is actually superior to warfarin in head-to-head -head trials. Yep. While all of the other trials with the other three have come up with equivalents. Mm. And there's nothing wrong with equivalents, but if you were to sort of rank them, then Pradaxa probably has some benefit. <coughs> why did we therefore end up with Rivaroxaban, simple, a reasonable proportion of people with dibigatran have really bad upper GI upset. Yep. And there are a group of people as well who just can't remember to take two pills a day. So yep. in one fell swoop because of a good offer, I'm sure, we've ended up with Rivaroxaban, um, Xarelto, which fills that gap very nicely. I have no real preference. So if someone says, I'd rather have one drug, not two, um, then you would, you would go with rivaroxaban. If someone's concern was they wanted the best stroke prevention that you could possibly offer them, mm. and they wanted a drug that had a reversal agent mm. on the end of a needle, then you would go with the Bigotran. Mm. And that's perhaps something to consider in the rural setting where access to intervention, if you are bleeding, is further away, perhaps choosing something with the reversible reversibility as a... That's yeah. an advantage. Yeah. yeah. But re I should say this reassuringly, all the head-to-head, -head, no, sorry, not head-to-head -head data, because there really isn't any, but all the real world data collected on who bleeds in the modern era, no X are the safe things and warfarin remains mm. the dangerous thing. So there's yeah. absolutely no mileage left in saying the new drugs are dangerous and warfarin safer. That yeah. is just not true. And the other real advantage of these new agents, um, apart from the fact that you don't need blood tests, and if you're selling used cars, this is so much easier than selling warfarin to someone. The other major difference is that the hemorrhagic stroke risk is dramatically lower in NOAX. Yep. And that's what you died from on warfarin. Yeah, and what you don't you, want to have. That's yep. what you don't want to have. Yep. That alone, I think, is the most convincing thing. Yep. It's not that it won't happen, but it's a factor of 10 less. Less. Yeah. It's come up a couple of um, comments that Dibigatran still has to remain in its foil packet, so therefore cannot go into blister packs. Uh, do I understand that's the case? Yep. Yeah. So Maybe a small limiting factor for some patients. I think it is. Although, if they had blister packs big enough, they could put it in the foil <laughs> in the blister pack. Yep, yep. I've often thought, but, you know, they don't want to do that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And within the, in the realm of anticoagulation, we, all of us face the difficult situation of frail elderly people who are at, falls of, you know, at risk of falling, and we feel cautious about, about prescribing anticoagulation. But I was wondering if you could comment on you know, your feelings around when we should be prescribing and how balancing up that risk of stroke versus the risk of falls and banging your head. Yeah, um, difficult. Um, and if you... And, and the literature is confused about this as well. The bleeding mm. scores, all of them, has bled and so on. If you look at them, they're exactly the same things that go into the Chad's VAS mm. score. Um, <laughs> so you predict a higher stroke risk in people that are also predicted to have a higher bleeding risk mm. in, in the majority of people. I think um, eyeball and knowledge of people is probably more valuable than anything else. Mm. I think we over magnify that risk of side effects probably mm. a bit more than we should. And yeah. we should have the courage of our convictions that stroke is devastating and often the beginning 
of life ending events. Yeah. You probably should choose lower doses options of anticoagulants a bit more than we do. Mm -hmm. I tend to use 110 milligrams of dibigatran in most of my older people and yeah. 15 milligrams of rivaroxaban. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's even a 10 milligram tablet, which is not uh, on record, but maybe for the real fragile where you can't make your mind up, that might not be a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. We had one paper presented that suggested that patients probably had to fall once a day for them, for their risk to start getting into the realm of being greater than that of having a, a stroke. So yes. yeah. we probably have been a bit cautious. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. Gary, anything else that fits with the, the anticoagulation side of things. Jerry, you're, you're very clear about um, the fact that now we know that the NOACs are better than warfarin, but are there any situations in where, where we have to stay with warfarin and, and can't use the newer agents? So bad renal function remains an issue. Um, so if your EGFR is 30 or lower, then dibigatran is off-label. Um, the only drug that in this category that's a little better than that is the one that we don't have a pixaban, which has been tested down to about 20 EGFR, which can be make quite a difference for a lot of older people, but um, it is fairly expensive to self fund. So you've got that group of people who um, need to be on warfarin still. And I just shouldn't forget this. The other um, indication is a prosthetic heart valve where um, the new novel oral anticoagulants have not been thoroughly tested. So it's always warfarin still for mechanical heart valves. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some other so occasional ones as well, but they're the two bigger groups. Yeah. Um, Jerry, I can just see that Jan has asked that if, if there's any role for prescribing 75 milligrams of dibigatran, he's done that on occasion. And he's also just wondering about the timing of restarting anticoagulation if someone's had a bleeding event, such as a GI bleed. What sort of time frame do we need to wait? Yeah, so um, Jan, you are probably aware that the FDA was so convinced that dibigatran was superior at 150 that they wouldn't, they still to this day do not have 110 milligram strength in the US. And therefore, uh, in the US, there is a very large body of experience in using 75 milligrams BD for people with um, bleeding risk or bad kidneys. It has never been systematized, disappointingly. Um, and it's harder to get your hands on in New Zealand, of course. Um, but for people with impaired renal function, theoretically, a 75 would be a good idea. And you get down to probably a EGFR of 15 to 20 by using 75. Mm. But there is no one's ever done a calculator, but I'm waiting for it. I'd love to have it. Yeah. Fortunately, we've got the 110 strength. So the, the Yanks are using the 75 and where we use the 110 because they've yep. been allowed to have it in the US. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I Finally, missed something there. What else did he ask? Oh, he, no, no, you're right. He said, and if you've had a bleeding event, such as a oh, yeah. GI bleed, what time frame do you need to wait? Oh, so that's got to be one of those things where you suck your finger and hold it up to see what the wind direction is. Yeah. I think it's not a reason to stop anticoagulant of any sort permanently because many little GI bleeds are whatever, diverticular disease um, uh, uh, and, and even bleeding uh, urinary tract bleeding is urinary infections or prostatitis in men or whatever. I think you basically re-challenge after a couple of weeks off and see what happens. Um, and obviously in many people, bleeding is a stress test for colon cancer or, uh, you know, tumors in your bladder. So in a way you do people a favor. So you follow those things up with appropriate investigations and you sometimes are lucky enough to find early colon cancers that can be resected and so on. So in a way, they, they are things that are valuable if you follow them up. Yep. And, and finally, Jerry, just, you know, you see so much AF and you get rung about AF so frequently with questions. It drives that, me crazy, Matilda, actually. Is there some little pearls that you would love <laughs> that every doctor in New Zealand just could carry with them? 
So I think the way that we approach atrial fibrillation acutely has been just wrong. We were so worried about people having a stroke when we'd seen them that we went through weird contortions about getting people cardioverted immediately so that they didn't leave the place in atrial fibrillation. And if you really think about why did we do that, we were, we were wor worried about the gap that it took warfarin to become active. Mm. It takes about two weeks for warfarin to actually deliver the goods. And on the way to be having an INR that's useful, you actually become pro-coagulant even with a good INR for a while. So we all knew that stuff. And we were basically sidelined by this strange drug warfarin. So now, in almost everybody that you see, you don't turn it into a medical emergency because it isn't. You put someone on a simple rate controlling drug, which would be a decent dose of a beta blocker. You might watch them for a few hours to make sure that they slow down. Mm. If you give them a tinchy little dose, they won't slow down. So give them a decent dose so you can get them out of your emergency room or your waiting room sooner. So that means at least five of bisoprolol or at least 47.5 of some kind, you know, of, of, a, of metoprolol. And you give them an oral anticoagulant like rivaroxaban or dabigatran immediately because they become active, full anticoagulation within two or three hours. Yep. You don't need to give blood and clexane. You don't need to put them in hospital and put them on drips. And by the same token, you don't need to get them out of atrial fibrillation because a very large number of people who turn up with symptomatic AF will spontaneously yep. cardiovert within 36 to 48 hours. Yep. If you slow them down with a beta blocker and anticoagulate them. And yep. I think that's the take home message. Yep. Everyone needs to calm down about atrial fibrillation rather yep. than hype it up into a medical emergency. Yeah. Yeah. Gary, do you have any other AEF questions that you'd like to fire at Jerry? So, look, there's lots of other questions, so lots of other little questions there, but I, I, I think we've done really, really well, and I think that's probably yep. a, a pretty good uh, place to wrap it up. Yep. We were going to talk about SVT as well. I feel like perhaps we've <laughs> come to a good point, and that might take us another hour to get through SVT. Do you think, Jerry? Yeah, I'm happy to do that with you again at some other time because I think these I webinar think things should be short and snappy in a way. That's right. You know, I done. think we wouldn't do it justice. Um, and I, I hope that if there's any other questions out there, you know, you, we can we can filter specific things through to to Jerry. Um, I just do notice one thing there that I might add, um, Jerry, is the question around the pill in the pocket. Um, yep. For instance, with Fleck and I, and your thoughts about, you know, is there a role for that? Maybe that will leave with that with our last question. So once you've got people worked up, you've found out why they've had AF, and in most you won't find a reason. So that's the calm down, get an echo, you know, get some input about what's going on, ruled out thyrotoxicosis, blah, blah, blah. So if you find people that, that have got structurally normal hearts and you're not worried about things like um, coronary artery disease being present or angina, then you've got some choices about whether you put them on a prophylactic pill. This is when you're in back in sinus rhythm, of course. Yep. Yeah. Or every day or whether you, if they're totally well and are against that, yep. you just give them something to take if it ever happens again. Yep. In which case you would usually give people a beta blocker at a decent dose, five of bisoprolol, a 50 milligram of metoprolol tartrate because it's faster acting than the slow release, 47.5, something yep. like that, to be taken stat and again in a couple of hours if they don't slow down when they're on the aeroplane over the yep. Pacific. Yep. And if you were really worried about them, you might, if they do it all the time, you might even give them uh, an oral anticoagulant to start taking at the same time. Yep. Now, if they, they've tried that and it hasn't worked, then if typically with a bit of advice, pill and pocket flecainide is quite good as well for the same yep. reason. And there, variably, remember there are two different forms of flecainide. There's the slow release form, which would act slowly if you took it. Mm. And there are 50 and 100 milligram base drug. And if you're going to use the pill and pocket, it would be 
two or 300 milligrams yep. of the base drug taken stat. Because it's going to work. It's going to work faster. And that's yep. what most of these people who are in and out of AF want. Yep. And I think that's a good, good idea as well. Yep. So uh, the idea of pill in pocket is that you genuinely expect these people to have very infrequent events, but you can't exclude it. Yep. Lots of people have very active traveling lives and you're trying to equip them with a first aid kit for an unlikely event. Yep. I think it's a really good idea. It's excellent. Yep. Well, I just want to say that that brings us to the end of our first CME webinar. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much for everyone who's you know taking time out of the evenings to come along. And thank you very much, Jerry, for your time and your expertise in working Pleasure. with us. Um, we really welcome everyone's feedback, both good and bad. This is a work in progress and we want to keep things going. So I'd love to hear from people um, what, their, what their thoughts are. And I will send the, the link out um, so that people can have access to the recording and to share that with people. Um, and take care everyone and enjoy the rest of their, their evenings. Ka kite Good on you, Matilda. Thank you very Thanks much so for much, having guys. me. Bye. Good night.